This is the Fundamental Escape Podcast with your host, Mark Fitzgerald. I'm David Warba, and this is Episode 9. So, Mark, we have Barry Taylor on the show today, who's a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's also an author, producer, and the former road manager for ACDC. Oh, excuse me, I, my friend Angus is sitting next to me in the studio. He likes to play guitar. And he likes to interrupt people at inopportune moments. Um, anyway, there's a few points that Barry made that stood out to me. One being, he didn't really convert to Christianity, which The Guardian wrote a feature article about this. It stated that he converted to Christianity during the Highway to Hell tour. That's not exactly accurate, and Barry explains that in the interview. He also says that in your spiritual discovery, it's all about looking for the right questions and not looking for the perfect answers. I thought that was pretty interesting. He also makes it clear that he's not trying to convert people to his way of thinking. He would rather just like people to be thinking, period. And finally, he feels that the Bible is not a guidebook. And if it were a guidebook, we'd all be screwed because it's like a map without roads. Does that make sense, Mark? <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty much. So he made some pretty amazing points, and we had a really, really great conversation. I, I just wanted to point out to the listeners that a lot of the sentiments that Barry brought to the table were essentially a lot of the the ideas that we're trying to convey with the podcast. And he's very down-to-earth and very grounded in his, his viewpoints. We talked about different things, one of which was the idea of Christianity being all about the light and growing up on a diet of Christianity, essentially, that was all about the light. And I can totally resonate with that for, for myself. That was so true for me, and I, I know will be so true for many people listening as well. And yeah, we essentially talked about the idea of owning your own life and your decisions as opposed to falling back on this notion that there's a god who has this plan mapped out for you that you have to just figure out and, and follow like a recipe sort of thing it's it's more about you know confronting the darkness and owning owning your life essentially so okay my friend angus is getting a little impatient here so let's get to the interview with barry taylor Hey everyone, welcome to the Fundamental Escape Podcast. My guest today is Barry Taylor, who is the artist in residence at the Brim Center at Fuller Theological Seminary and a self-described provocateur. Do you want to introduce yourself there, Barry? Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so could you elaborate on the term provocateur? Uh, I'm sure I was being sarcastic. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what... what particular video you heard that on. Um, I, I think I, for some reason um, I've, I've kind of been termed that probably more by other people than by myself. But I guess um, maybe in the environments that I move in, maybe I just come at things from a slightly different angle every once in a while and it seems to create some kind of provocation of the status quo. I don't know. <laughs> Oh man, I can definitely resonate with that. Uh, part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is to create space, you know, for those that uh, don't seem to fit in. I've always been the kind of person myself that seems to ask questions that those around me aren't asking. Yeah, exactly. Me too. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I ask the questions first and foremost of myself. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a self provocateur to begin with. <laughs> I don't let myself, I don't let myself get away with my own stuff. So yeah, I was um, I was curious to know a little bit about your background. Obviously, you are known as the road manager for yeah. ACDC, but I was more interested to know if you did grow up in a religious environment at all. No, absolutely not at all. I mean, I grew up in England, uh, so you have token religious exposure at school you know you have religious education and technically every everybody's anglican <laughs> kind of do you know you know what i mean in terms of, you know state state religion but no uh, i come from a completely um non-religious family i think the only person that ever went to church in my family is my grandmother 
So now uh, I don't know, you know, all the details from what what I understand. You converted to Christianity on the highway to Hell tour with ACDC, which is somewhat ironic to say the least. Well, um, well, it's a bit more complicated than that, and I, and I think you know, um, it, it's it's interesting because I, I, I've been on something of a, a a journey since since those days. And I think one of the biggest journeys I've been on is is a journey through language, and so um, you know, for for a long time, that whole kind of conversion angle story, um, that's how how things get framed, and and I think um, really I, don't, I well for a start, I I never had a conversion to Christianity, um, in 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 my time with. Uh, ACDC because I actually wasn't looking for religion and I really wasn't looking for God. I was sort of, uh, I, I just kind of reached a point where um, I was just trying to work out how I could be uh, basically a more decent human being um, at, at, the, at the core of at, at the core of me. And I think partly, you know, I mean, being on the road with uh, a band is a, is an interesting experience. It's like running away. It's like running away to the circus, and kind of all bets are all bets are off. You know, you you kind of live this somewhat. I don't know if it's transgressive. You just live this life where, you know, you're in town and you're in town to throw a party that everybody wants to be at, and then you leave and go somewhere else. And and while you're working, you know, it, it's rock and roll and it's music and there's a lot of stuff going on. And um, the the that that period was a, a kind of a pretty hedonistic period in in my life, and it wasn't that I was particularly uh, I wasn't really struggling o over over that as much as I was just I I, I sort of didn't like the, the the person that I was becoming, um, and in some ways that's kind of difficult to explain because it's not one thing. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I mean, I, you know, I took a lot of drugs, but it wasn't because I was taking drugs. You know, I, I had a lot of sex, but it wasn't because I had a lot of sex. It was kind of like how all, how the shape that my life was taking that was, that was really the kind of thing that was concerning me most. And, and, and that had always been a concern for me. I don't know why, but I'd, I'd always been kind of um, sort of reaching for these deeper senses of uh, uh, of my myself and i think really after you know being on the road with a band which in some ways is very much you know whether you're in a band you know and i i love music or you're working for a band and and, and you're in that sort of world in, in in you know generations you know since the emergence of pop culture that whole kind of fame celebrity pop music thing is, has been very much a, a kind of model for a, a way to get the best life. You know what I mean? And I think, and I think for me that I, I just sort of realized, yeah, you know, it's just the same. You know, it's, sure, I'm traveling around the world work, working for a band, but but I'm still working for I'm still working, um, and, I, and and I'm still dealing with myself, and I'm still dealing with people, and it's it's I get well paid. It's privilege. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of license and. Um, all, all that kind of stuff, but I, I, I was just restless, restless internally. So I, I sort of began this process, and my, and my process sort of started with my primary interest, which was kind of uh, philosophy and kind of writings around philosophy. Um, so, you know, I was sort of into Nietzsche and, and, you know, all the typical stuff that everybody is into when they're young. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean? When you're young and restless, you know, you're, it doesn't matter. It seems, you know, years later, I still talk to people and they're still reading the same things, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. but, but I realized fairly quickly that um, a lot of sort of Western philosophy particularly was a reaction against, in some way, religion. And I didn't really have any thoughts about religion. I, I, I mean, I'd been exposed to it. Um, I figured I knew what it was about, and, and I figured I wasn't really uh, into it. But I wanted to understand a bit more the kind of philosophical, the reasons the philosophers were sort of railing the way they were, uh, beyond just my opinion. 
yeah, what was behind it and, and, and what really made it tick. And, and then I was like, well, why do I have a thought about religion? Religion's kind of important. So, so why am I so dismissive of that? You know, so, I, so <laughs> while I'm on the road and we're driving in, in, in a bus and stuff, I started this kind of um, set personal study of like philosophy books. And then I turned to religious books and um, I kind of went through them all. And and I and the last one I got actually was the last book I bought was a Bible, because I figured I wasn't really interested in Christianity, and as I said, I really wasn't interested in God. Um, and to be honest, to be honest, which will sound insane considering what I've done for the last thirty years, I'm still not that interested in God. And, and I think really what what I've realised in the last decade is that. Um, I got sidetracked a little bit by the, obsess the obsession that uh, Christianity has with connecting everything to God as the big other. And um, so even like, so my, my, so my language about all this has changed over the years. So it's a really long answer to a, <laughs> to a really simple question. But no, that, that's, that's fine. You were actually... Reminding me of uh, something I heard you mention yeah. at the Homebrewed Christianity event about the idea that if we're reading the same books and listening to the same speakers, we need, you know, to get a life. And I have to oh, yeah, admit yeah. that I'm the kind of person who will fully subscribe yep. to one person and, you know, read everything that they put out. And then sadly, I basically become quite resentful towards that person because they inevitably fail to bring me the answers yeah. that, you know, that I was hoping for. Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, here, and, and, and the lesson, lesson, it's not a lesson. The thing that I've, that, that I've realized o over the years um, is I actually don't read books anymore for answers. I read, I read books for um, the questions that they raise and the um, environments that they create where new questions can be answered. So, um, and part of my thing with in that little rant, rant or trips thing is, you know, you get with it, you get with a bunch of, uh, you get with a bunch of people and everybody's reading the same book. And, um, it's too homogenized, you know, we ought to be able to be more diverse in, a, in our interests and our scopes and give ourselves permission not not to just read only what everybody else has read, you know what I mean? Like whenever somebody says, here's the top 10 books you should read, I never read those books. I want to I wanna read, read the 10 they don't want to read. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard you talk about the idea of growing up on a diet of Christianity that was all about the light and about having all the answers so you know this was definitely my experience as well and i i wonder what we can do to to change that you yeah you and just about every other person under 50 in uh, the entire western hemisphere or, and southern hemisphere i mean you know what i mean i mean and, and part of the deal i think is um that increasingly for lots of people um the the stories that we've been told are actually, I said this some of the other week, I said it's not the stories in the Bible that are the problem, it's the interpretations that are problematic for us, the way in which we've been shaped um, by certain tellings of the tale. And I, and I think the struggle for a lot of people today is that uh, there's uh, an exhaustion uh, of those ideas you know or are coming to an exhaustion of those ideas you know so you know rob writes his book about you know love wins and uh you know ra raises up this specter of you know w what happens when people die um, you know and whether or not hell exists and stuff like that doesn't raise other important questions like whether or not it's possible to have heaven without hell um, which I don't think is the case. So I think if you abandon hell, you also have to abandon heaven. But that's another conversation. And, and it still uh, operates on the premise that uh, the afterlife is something about which we can 
uh, converse uh, in some sort of definitive way, which again, I think is uh, a conjecture at best. You, you know what I mean? But what it does tell you is, is that um, there are for a lot of people serious questions about these understandings that we have about how this whole Christian thing works that people are, are, are attempting to find new answers for and it's difficult because uh, you run into this um, wall, the, the, the kind of wall of, you could say it's the wall of orthodoxy but I, I think it's pseudo-orthodoxy because I actually think most of the stories that we've inherited are, are very modern interpretations of the tale so I don't think it's real I don't think it's really uh, or I think orthodoxy is what people bandy around when they don't when they feel threatened they question orthodoxy and they shut down the conversation but people people want to be right um, they, they don't want to um, make mistakes you, you know what I mean so we sort of look around laterally for other people who are thinking and talking and writing hoping that they're going to give us the answers, and I, I, I think at this stage in the game, uh, answers are few and far between, and it, it's the refining of the questions that, that, are, that are really, um, that's really the, the game and, and, and what's really um, important, because I think you have to kind of work out what the questions are first. And, uh, yeah, and, but but that's, it's, a very it's a very challenging time. I mean, it's a challenging time for religion in general. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting time because you know, there's a sort of resurgence of uh, religion in, in, in many different guises and forms, but, but traditional religions, in spite of, you know, the expansive, you know, and, and, and some would say continuing growth of Christianity, um, it's not like looking that great on the horizon, really, you know, and particularly in uh, Western countries where it just seems to be falling off the, the edge of the earth, you know, you know what I mean, in terms of ability to speak to the situations of life yeah ah, oh, for sure I, I guess you know one thing i find fascinating and i spoke with brian mclaren about this is the idea that social media and technology is so much changed uh, the whole dynamic of faith i mean i grew up in a world where faith could exist as a separate entity to the rest of the world but now with things like facebook we you know we're all in the same place yeah but i also think the, the other side of that equation is it's not just the the uh the technology kind of facilitates this uh dissemination of what already is i actually think that um technology reshapes the the playing field for conversations about the sacred as well and, and I think we you know I, I don't think we we get the um, the easy ride of switching technologies without realizing that there's impact on notions of the sacred that come along with that you know there's that there's that quote from uh, Derrida who Der, you know Jacques Derrida said said that the the, the growing disconnect between uh, the technologies that we use, this is a paraphrase, but between the technologies that we use and our understanding of them has opened up a space for, for the return and the rise of animism, mysticism and magic. And basically what he's saying is, you know, we, we, we live in a world where we all are incredibly and increasingly dependent and interdependent upon technologies about which most of us know absolutely nothing. You know, beyond sort of basic things like I, I, I don't know how I'm. I mean, I, I sort of know that I am skyping with you right now, but I don't really understand fully and completely how that works. Do you know what I mean? But by the same token, the phenomenon of it working, and the fact that we rely on these technologies that most of us couldn't make or build, we couldn't create them. We, we, we shouldn't be surprised, Derrida says, what, that, that there's an increase of interest in mystery and, uh, and magic and animism because we've, we've opened up this, myster this, this space of sort of mystery within the culture through the technologies that we use. I think, and, I th and I think that's actually a, a, a very unreflected upon element in the whole conversation about religion that, that we have because it's not, you know, 
you know, there, there are conversations about religion and, you know, digitality on, on some levels, but it's usually arguments about, you know, is Facebook real community or is church real community? Answer, I think, is probably both and neither. But, 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 but the question isn't, isn't really, um, isn't really that. It, it, it's like, or, or how is technology? Because, you know, we, we, we you know, we, we talk about cyberspace. Well, where does that fit into our scheme? What is, you know, where, where is t cyberspace exactly? Uh, and uh, how does that affect conceptions of time? Because you and I are, are on the other sides of the world. You're 19 hours ahead of me, but we're talking in real time at the moment. And, and we're essentially outside of, uh, of uh, Greenwich Mean Time. We're just having a chat. Uh, person to person, we're both awake, and uh, all of the the previously sort of uh, limiting circumstances are, are are wiped away by by cyberspace. And if we don't think that has impact on our notions of the sacred, then I think we're nuts. <laughs> now you're uh, now you're showing your age. <laughs> That's what I meant as an old man saying I don't understand technology. <laughs> <laughs> So I recently spoke with Reba Riley on the podcast, who has written a book called Post Traumatic Church Syndrome. And there was a part in the book where she was talking about being in a coffee shop with her Christian friends, who basically told her that she isn't a Christian anymore and that she was bringing their faith down. Uh, and they basically just end up leaving her alone, like in a, in a crying mess, basically. And I know that you speak about the idea of confronting our own darkness. And I just wonder where that idea started to resonate with you well i i think um I, I i i sort of you know how you um well how it actually began is it it, it began because um i i, I went to a, a an exhibit of um it, at the royal academy in london and it, and it was uh painters um around um Caravaggio, you know the Italian, the Italian painter who paints like these very intense and emotional um, paintings, and the kind of whole school of uh, art that grew up around him, which was basically this 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 um, use of light and darkness, and and um, and, I, and I'd always liked Caravaggio, and and I and I got really into um, his work. And, uh, and I was sort of fascinated by the way that uh, it was all the darkness and the shadows in the painting that made the, the, the light seem so much more palpably real. And he had, the, you know, he has a, a really famous painting of uh, the conversion of St. Paul. And, um, and you know, it, it's Catholic, so there's a horse involved. Because, you know, you don't know that Paul was riding a horse. We just assume he was. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it, we just assume. So, you know, it's really funny. Protestant Protestant tellings of that story, there isn't a horse. But Catholic paintings, there usually is. But anyway, uh, you know, so I, I sort of went back. I, I don't know. It just prompted me to go back and, and, and look at the story for some re reason. And I realized that, um, you know, we always, and I was thinking about this whole notion of conversion and, and, and the whole premise and predication, you know, you have to be converted, you have to have this experience and stuff. And, and, and so I was looking at this, you know, because you get the, the conversion of St. Paul and stuff, and I just read the story and I was like, well, yeah, but he got struck blind first. So he got shoved into darkness and... Um, and it was the darkness that actually did the work on him. It's the same in, in like the Old Testament with the story of Samson. You know, when when uh, when Samson finally gives up the secret of his strength, and the Philistines cut, you know, they cut his hair and they finally take him. The first thing they do is they gouge his eyes out, and he goes blind. He can't see anymore. And uh, I, I think it's a, a, a metaphor for. Um, looking inside yourself because in both those situations whether it's Samson you know uh, or, or, or Saul they have this assumption about the world and that they're looking at the world but they actually can't see reality neither one of them and um, 
and in both cases, I mean, in, in, in Samson's case, um, his awareness comes as his hair grows back, but, it, but it's blindness that facilitates the loss of strength and blindness. You know, so complete vulnerability and internalization is what sets Samson finally on the course of his life. And the same thing's true for uh, Saul, because, you know, he, he's like all powerful letters from the Pharisees, you know, and then that happens and he has to be held by the hand and, and he sits in um, darkness for three days, you know, lots of analogies there, but... Um, and then someone comes and he gets his sight back and he sees the world differently. And um, and as someone who in life has struggled a little bit with both, I mean, I, I'm English, so melancholy is my, my neutral mode. And then I, I, I've also been one of those people that's wrestled a little bit with um, depression in life and, and, and sort of really kind of, struggled with the, those kind of dark threads and, and I just sort of come to realize that we I think we run too quickly to the light and, and part of the problem uh, and so one of my critiques of contemporary one of my broad critiques of contemporary Christianity is it's too light it's too Jesus is gonna fulfill everything you know it's it, Jesus has got a destiny for you but you know it's like it's like this big it's like a big blank check where your life becomes just so much more than it ever was and I think that's patently um, untrue I don't think uh, I don't think really God has a plan for people's lives I think actually that's uh, the folly and, and I think yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think that when we buy into that idea, it's almost like we refuse to own our own lives in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, completely. I mean, I, I, I think that um, the whole, if there's a, a message, if there's a message in uh, Christianity, it's that you are given the the gift of life to do with what you will, um, provided you're willing to accept responsibility for um, the decisions and the choices that you make, both right and wrong. And I think a lot of people, and people sit around, I mean, you know, I've, I, I've been involved in churches for 30 years in sort of some leadership capacity. And the number of people who come across and, you know, I just don't know what God wants me to do and sort of, uh, worried about you know getting it right and I'm like well what do you want to do do what you want to do because you know, God doesn't say that much because there's a there's an industry uh, of, of dependency of telling people you know God's got a plan for you and it's brilliant you stand up front and you tell people that and uh, but you don't have to do the you actually don't have to do the job of telling people what that is you know you, um, and and I also think that as human beings, it taps into a flaw in us, which is that there's a part of us that doesn't want to take responsibility for our existence. And I understand that because, you know, I, I mean, anytime I can shirk responsibility, I will. So it's not, not a finger pointing thing. I think it's just a reality, though, that I'm quite, you know, it'd be great. How fantastic, how fantastic is it if all of the guessing is taken out of it? And I get to uh, just be told what to do. Well, actually, that does take all the fun out of it, you know. And uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's to take responsibility for one's existence is to grow up. And um, again, my little rant at that homebrew thing was really just a, a ranting against uh, immature and juvenile uh, interpretations of is that just keep people locked in this cycle of dependency um, and really going nowhere but acting like it's all a big thing. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder, you know, do you ever get resistance from people when you say some of these kinds of things? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, what, you know, there are always people, I mean, you know, not everybody likes what you have to say. And, um, and, uh, I mean, 
at those homebrewed events, there's definitely a constituency of people uh, for whom the the status quo is, is kind of not what they're looking for. So it's a fairly friendly audience. But as I said, uh, maybe that's where the provocateur thing comes in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of sitting around uh, agreeing with a whole bunch of things, you know. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's usually... There's usually some detraction, let's just say that. Not always, but 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 that but that's okay. I, I don't mind that. And and I, I actually don't I'm not like uh I'm not an evangelist in the sense that I, I want to convert people to um my way of thinking. Um I just want I, I, I just uh I'd like people to to be thinking and uh consider what they think about things in, in in a critical way and and ask questions of themselves, you know. Yeah, see, I am an evangelist and I do find myself wanting others, you know, to be on the same page essentially as me. Yeah. But I guess part of that is more about solidarity and just not wanting to feel alone. Yeah. I, know, I, I mean, I do the same thing. I mean, I, I you know, I'll, I'll always tell somebody if, you know, I, I, I've read a book that I like or, or, or heard somebody that I think is, you know, worth worth listening to. But I mean, I don't need I don't need everybody around me to think what I think about things to be okay about it. There, there was another thing that I really appreciated. You said at that homebrewed event, which was the idea that it's not the church's job to fix people, and that people that try to fix others don't know what the fuck they're yeah. doing with their own lives. Yeah, I mean, I. Of course, you know, sometimes people need help to sort themselves out. Um, but, uh, and, and I think what I was trying to, what I was really trying to say is, is that um, there are some things about us that don't get repaired. And uh, there, there's a notion within a, a lot of Christianity that's riddled with kind of perfectionism. And I think it creates uh, an, a, a pressured environment for a lot of people where they they feel um, less than able to be honest and open because their lives are a bit of a mess and they don't know how to sort them out. And um, sometimes the worst place they can be in that situation is in a church because there's just not the right the right kinds of tools to help people like i see i think that for me it's it's about being in a space where you can be who you are and what you are um in complete openness and vulnerability even as you're trying to deal with the things in your life that you that you need to face i mean we all have stuff that 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 we need to address and, 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 and deal with. And I'm certainly not saying that everybody should just, you know, accept where they are and uh, not attempt to uh, a, a, a address whatever weaknesses, challenges, hopes, dreams that, you know, we feel we feel we want to. But, but, but the notion that, you know, the church sort of sorts everybody out and uh, gets everybody kind of in line and fixed up and uh, has all the tools to help somebody make their life uh, rich and flourishing. I just don't, I, I just don't buy it. I, I, I think there's so much um, like, you know, I, if somebody comes to me and they it, like, if somebody comes to me and, and they say, you know, I, I, I want to talk about my spiritual life. I, I say, well, I'm happy to talk to you about your life, because um, I don't actually believe in a, I don't believe in a spiritual life. I believe in, I, I I don't believe in in the dualism of a spiritual life and then the 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 rest of life. And I think the larger point I was trying to make is that the church sort of wants to put everything through uh, the narrow gate of Jesus. In that, the, it, it wants to look at life. You know, it's like you fix the spiritual life, and everything else will be okay. Again, I think it's a flawed notion, and and, and I, I I think we have to look at life 
as a whole, not as, as you know, and, and spirituality as, as a whole and not just as a compartment. And I know that's what people mean. They're sort of saying, well, it's the most important part of your life. But A, I don't know that it is. And, and, and B, I, I just don't think life is separated into those kind of categorizations. And so uh, I'll say, look, I'm happy to talk with you about your life, but I can't fix you. And, uh, and a Bible verse probably isn't going to help you. Um, <laughs> you might, you know, you, you might want to go to an AA group or you might want to find yourself a therapist or you might want to go, you know, deal, deal with, deal with some stuff. Yeah. It, it seems to me that people get very defensive when you start to talk about the way they do things and question it or, you know, the tradition <laughs> that we grew up with it, when you you know when you start to find truth in all kinds of interesting places well you know it's we get threatened by um we get threatened by we seemingly get threatened by things that we don't need to really be threatened about i don't think but i don't know why that is it's like well i do know why it is it's like we have this notion that if you know you learn something from somewhere else it can't be can't be right you know but the fact of the matter is is that you know the Bible is is a remarkable um, a remarkable piece of literature and uh, Christianity is, is uh, like most of the sort of long-lasting religions of the world uh, an incredible wellspring of um, inspiration and, and a help and, and all those kind of things but but the fact of the matter is is that there are so many uh, tools available today outside of the realm of religion that that can um, answer questions much more. Um, you know, it's like you know, you know, John Caputo. Yeah, he's got this great line. He said he's got this line. He says, "Technology repeats theology." And, uh, and, so, and what he means by that, as he said, like, you know, in, uh, or an example might be in, in, in the Bible, if, if, if you're barren, the only way you get unbarren is if God uh, performs a miracle on you. Um, but today, um, there are any number of scientific and medical and technological advancements that can address, can, uh, uh uh, address that in exactly the same way and it's miraculous you, you know what I mean um, so I forget what I was trying to say I was trying to say something profound about the Bible uh, or, or Saki um, I, I, I was just trying to say that, that um, we, we want to tell everybody that every answer to your existence is in the Bible and it just isn't it just isn't it's not that kind of book and the, so and so when, when somebody goes off and finds help and hope somewhere else we're threatened instead of going oh of course this is this is the the the, the main fabric of uh, of my life but how can it have you know it's like you can't you can't find answers to everything in the bible there's about you know there's there's been any <laughs> conversation about things it's like you know debates about sexuality well, well good luck with that yeah. you know you're uh, actually reminding me of a bit that Ricky Gervais does about the Bible, where he talks about a religious teacher yeah. that he had, you know, uh, who said to him that every law of the land is in, in the Bible somewhere. And he put his hand up and he's like, what, even video piracy? Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I know that, you know, I, I know that people don't mean, you know, they, they, I know they mean the core of life. And I would agree that, you know, the core of Western culture is built on the back of a Judeo-Christian value and idea. But the notion that it can address every aspect of life, it's just foolish. And it's not necessary. That's the problem. We, we, we overreach by trying to make it. It doesn't just doesn't need to be that. And, 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 and you know, it's like it, so it's like a, a fish out of water. Then you, you're putting it in environments where it doesn't belong. It's not a guidebook. If the Bible is a guidebook, we're all screwed because it's like, it's like a map without roads on it. Do you, do you know what I mean? I mean, we're just completely up up a creek without a paddle. If if the Bible, if the I mean, yes, sure, 
in, in larger senses. So uh, living a life of, of, of love and grace and generosity and forgiveness. But but that's not how people talk about it. They're, 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 you know, it's like you, know, you have radio shows, the word for today, you know, and, you know, God's got a word for you this week, you know, and uh, or, you know, or, or those kind of things. It's like, get real, get real. I mean, the the level of dialogue between God and humanity in the Bible is minimal at best. And you have a few people for whom these encounters, like, you know, going back to the story of, of Saul. Well, Saul had that conversion experience, but nobody else did. Everybody else just had to muddle through. It's like not everybody in the Old Testament was Moses. Not everybody saw a burning bush. Most people just saw the, the backside of the person in front of them as they walked out of Egypt, hoping that they were going to get free. No sense of calling, no sense of destiny, no clue, just milling around. Like, that's the real story. That's love. There maybe are a few people who have this profound sense of vocation or something. The rest of us just get to, like, uh, try and muddle through, I think. And and uh, maybe we need to be a little bit more honest about that. Like, you know, maybe what we should, maybe the primary message of Christianity is you're not special. And that in itself is fantastic. You know, you you're not unique. You're just another bloody human being out of seven billion. One million. Yeah. But, but see, to me, that that is good news. I think it is. And, you know, it also seems to me the idea that there there is a plan is such a heavy burden because you not only have to do what God wants you to do, you, you also have to figure out what it is. Yeah, usually what God wants you to do is what the person telling you doesn't like. You know, so stop doing what you don't like. I, like I remember once I was, uh, this is way back in the day, and um, I, I was recording this. <laughs> this is how long ago it was. It was supposed to be a worship album. So let's not even get into it. But let's just discuss the fact that uh, I, I'm, it's not going well in this recording studio. And, and this record company has assigned uh, uh, a record producer who I don't really know and who doesn't really know and understand me and the re I, and the recording process was being was getting a little frustrating and I was getting a little frustrated by by feeling like it was being taken out of my hands and um, the guy sort of takes me aside and he takes me in this room and he says you know he says I, I've I've isolated the problem here I'm like oh good <laughs> and uh, he says yeah you need to sacrifice the idols of your youth. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, he says, the problem is, is that you, you know, you're riddled with idols from your musical youth and all that rock and roll that you were into. And I'm like, yeah, that would be great. Except uh, just because I worked for ACDC didn't mean they were my idols. I said my idol was uh, Sam and the Soul Stirrers and the, the Clark Sisters. And I said I was raised on uh, uh, on a diet of black gospel and R&B, uh, you know, but it was this notion that, that you know, somehow because I, you know, because I'd listened to Led Zeppelin or something, um, I, you know, the whole process was, was ruined. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, we tell people, you know, the things that you're gifted at, God doesn't want you to do those, that martyr syndrome, you know, you've got to lay it on the altar. Like, really, I really want to play music. But God wants me to lay aside that altar and, you know, I'm going to become a plumber. Nothing wrong with being a plumber. But if you can play music and you want to play music, just play bloody music. Just play bloody music. And uh, and I'm like, what's up? I, I, I've said to people, I said, what kind of like a uh, mean spirited God are you actually talking about? Who like apparently gives somebody a gift, but then wants to take it away. That's like, that's just spiteful. There's, there's, no, there's nothing of value in that. And all it does is create this martyr complex. Like, oh, you know, I, I, I laid this down on the altar for God. And I'm sure that'll upset people. But but I just think it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah pretty much. So, <laughs> so Reva Riley, who I mentioned earlier, talks about how even the word God became such a heavy word, it felt like a punch in the stomach. But the, you know, the sort of new age idea of referring to the universe seemed too ethereal and disconnected so she came up with the term god of this concluding that yeah. she had to lose the word god in order to find god well yeah and, and you know that's one of the um 
that's one of the, the, the challenges and the shifts of the world in which we live, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm around a lot of uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I teach at a theological school and you get a lot of eye rolling around the whole statement, you know, well, I'm spiritual but not religious, you know what I mean? And I understand because it can be really just a, a lame way of doing your own thing. But I, but I do think there's something of profound importance there and that is that within the culture people are making a, a distinction uh, a distinction of interest they're not saying they're not interested in uh, the sacred or the divine or God or whatever but what they are saying is they don't find value in traditional iterations of those those concepts now part of that is because I think there's a lot of stereotyping um, and a lot of you know bad experience and let's just face it that the the worst example for the mo most of the time is the church itself so it doesn't really need outsiders to critique it, it does a pretty good job on its own but um, but I think it's really interesting that uh, you can have conversations with people in broad terms but when you want to bring it down to specifics of religion you get into um, difficult spaces you know one of my I, I, I'm a, I'm kind of a fan of uh, um, Gianni Vattimo, who's an Italian philosopher, and uh, he wrote this really interesting book um, called After Christianity. And in that book, that he 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 sort of makes this statement that that Christianity should become a non-religion um, and simply become a space where other people can talk about religion. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's um, that is interesting. That's an interesting idea, you know, to me, about this, yeah. creating space. And and it's funny that that Christianity gets boiled down to this idea of morality and just keeping the rules. You know, it's it seems to be what it what it's all about most of the time. And I think that that's what people get tired of. You know, because it's just like just forced on them to you know just to abide by the rules basically. yeah no I I, I I do understand that and, and, and I think that um, for a lot of people uh, it, it's a it's it's a problem it is a problem it is a problem word and and to some degree it's just a word I mean as Nick Cave says you know it's just the it's what we use it's the language that we use to throw a blanket over the invisible to give it shape and uh, it's a it's a loaded it's a loaded con it's a loaded concept and a loaded construct in this day in this day and age and very difficult for for people and again you know Jesus doesn't talk that much about God just saying <laughs> read Mark's gospel doesn't show up very often in that but but you know going back to your you know your your thing about um, about you know morality and stuff like that is is I actually think that um, to some degree sort of viewing Jesus as this kind of pathway to sort of a, a particular moral and ethical way of life is a little bit problematic um, I don't think really that's the entirety of, of what uh, Jesus is about you, you know what I mean I, I, I think to some degree, um, I, 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 th I think the, the, those they're, they're kind of symptoms. Um, it's like you know we 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 hold up these kind of and, and you see it in, in in and it's very easy to point to like hypocrisies in the church, you know. And it's unfortunate. I mean, churches are made up of people. It's our own, it's our own fault because we we set ourselves up to be high and mighty, and then when we fall, it's it's with a bigger it's with a big bug. You know, but um, there, there, there's a uh, we. You know, it, it's really funny because in a lot of churches we attack stuff, but people actually still do that stuff themselves. And um, something about making Jesus or church or Christianity just about morality and ethics, I think, sets up this strange dichotomy where it allows an underbelly to go to exist almost un, un, unattended I, you know it's like Paul you know the more we say 
we, we should keep the law, the more we should be moral and avoid immorality, the more our desire to be immoral seems to grow. You know, so, you know, so the louder the no, the greater the temptation to transgress the no. And, uh, and, and, that's, and then you wind up with guilt. So you, and so you have this whole culture of people riddled with guilt because they're loudly saying no um, to something that, that the louder they shout, the more they want. And, uh, and it's, pushing, um, it's pushing those desires and tendencies deep into the unconscious where eventually they get, they get lived out. And I, think, and I think this is where the opposite of morality and ethics is grace, I think. And that's where, and so this comes back to the earlier conversation we had about uh, churches and space. I, I, for me, they're, they're, they're not places to be fixed as much as they're places where we can bring darkness to the surface. And, and to speak about um, our struggles, our issues and stuff, without necessarily needing then immediately to move into let yeah. me fix that for you mode well yeah thanks so much barry for your time it's been amazing to speak with you and yeah you've shared some yeah really really cool stuff so i'm sure that um people listening will get a lot out of it so, that's great cool. to chat with you mate i hope it makes i hope it made some sense